Every good hero needs a good villain, and Yu-Gi-Oh! is in no short supply of those. From the eminently hateable and supremely petty Bandit Keith, to the flamboyant mastermind Maximilian Pegasus, to the charismatic Sartorius, to the nihilistic and ruthless Zone. And while this episode isn't a tier list of all of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s best baddies, yet, I am going to be planting my flag and saying that Bakura is one of the best. While participating as a minor antagonist throughout the original Duel Monsters run, it turns out that the reincarnated Thief King was actually playing the Long Con, guiding Yugi through his various trials and tribulations, culminating in the Dark RPG, a game by which the fell god Zork Necrophades could be reborn. But it's not just what he does, but how he acts. Not only do they have this hypnotizing thirst for revenge, Yami Bakura's obsession with using games as a means to his devious ends is a sick reflection, and sometimes painful reminder, of Yami Yugi, especially in their early days. And, as it turns out, that trait translates, at least somewhat, into the cards that this Spectre of the Sands brings to paper. So light the candles, break out the Ouija board, and get ready to spend some quality time with everyone's favorite obsessed occultist. It's time for Bakura explained. Today's episode is brought to you by my lovely patrons and the fine people over at Dragon Shield. If you want to protect your cards with the strongest scales on the market that even come with their own lore while supporting the channel, use my affiliate link in the description. So, what's the deal with Bakura? Uh, at least for their cards, I'll leave the character dissection to the more anime knowledgeable in the audience. In paper, Bakura is kind of in the same boat as Ashizu, where he has a bunch of cards that don't necessarily fall into a single archetype. But unlike Ashizu, Bakura gets a lot more screen time and a lot more duels, while not necessarily keeping to a singular theme. So, we're gonna be dividing things up based on time frame. First, we're gonna cover the cards from Yami Bakura's iconic first duel, where Yugi and friends were sealed into cards. Then, we'll cover the Battle City occult cards that don't really line up with any particular theme. Next, we'll take a quick peek at his later cards used in the anime, as well as ones used in the manga, before finally bringing it back home with the iconic cards that make up the Destiny board deck. So, for this first section, let's cover those normal monsters. We've got Happy Lover, a staple of Charmer lore, Lady of Faith, a card that connects Bakura and Small Fry All-Star Johnny Steps, and Doma, the Angel of Silence, which is peak old Yu-Gi-Oh! art design. But only Lady of Faith actually shows up in the duel. The others are part of an impromptu tarot reading to psych out Pegasus, so I'm not entirely sure those two should count. Now, the effect monsters, those don't start out much better. Electric Lizard here looks amazing, no doubt about that, but has some very limited functionality. It's a level 3 Earth Thunder monster with 850 attack and 800 defense, and if a monster attacks it, that attacking monster can't attack on its following turn unless that monster is a zombie. And you know what? I do actually like this effect from a certain angle. It adds a bit of utility to the types themselves that are a lot more common in the manga, where many times those types would have inherent properties. And in this case, electricity wouldn't work to paralyze a zombie because they don't have a functioning nervous system to overload. But problems begin to crop up uh, almost immediately. From a mechanical standpoint, this card is all but worthless anyway, and then when you throw in the fact that it gets hard countered simply by having a specific type, no one's gonna feel good playing this. Second, even the logic of the effect doesn't hold up to scrutiny. Like, what about the zombies that are still clearly living people, like Shiranui? What about monsters like Lava Golem? I doubt a giant hunk of burning rock has a nervous system to be messed with at all. Electric Lizard is actually kind of fascinating in that regard, but now I've come to the realization that now I've written way more about Electric Lizard than should even be possible or healthy. Thankfully, the next few cards are much more agreeable, because a lot of them are pretty powerful flip monsters, at least for their time. Mask of Darkness is a level 2 Dark Fiend monster with 900 attack and 400 defense that gets a trap card from your grave back into your hand when flipped, perfect for recovering things like trap holes, mirror forces, and solemn judgments. Maneater Bug is a level 2 Earth Insect monster with 450 attack and 600 defense that targets a monster on the field and destroys it when flipped. 
That's right, not even Weevil Underwood used this famous insect card. This was used by Bakura exclusively, and was a welcome source of removal during a time where that was pretty limited. Though be careful, this bug is so hungry that the effect is mandatory, so improper use could end up with you destroying one of your own monsters, even itself if it's desperate enough for those noms. Morphing Jar is also a pretty prominent card in Bakura's deck. It's a level 2 Earth Rock monster with 700 attack and 600 defense that causes both players to discard as many cards from their hand as possible, then they each draw 5 cards when flipped. A monster that's currently limited for its potential to run both players through a lot of cards if you sequence the correct flipping effects, leading to a deck known as Empty Jar. Because once you resolve it enough, it's not just the jar that's going to be empty, it's also going to be your opponent's deck. It still sees fringe play from time to time as a desperate way for players to refill their grip with gas, but trust me, this may be printed as a monster, but it's definitely a noob trap. The last of these monsters departs from the flip mechanic and is a big hit with all those progression series lovers out there, White Magical Hat. It's a level 3 light spellcaster monster with 1000 attack and 700 defense, and when it inflicts battle damage to your opponent's life points, your opponent discards a card randomly from their hand. Hey, more hand disruption! Bakura was just desperate to get Yugi's friends into the grave, huh? But you see what I mean so far, right? These cards don't have a grand unifying theme, they're all just meant to be annoying. It's, uh, honestly enough to make me question the conceit of this entire episode, but I'm already on page 2 of the script, and I've already invested far too much time to back down now. That crisis leaves us with this iteration of Bakura's Spells and Traps. Chain Energy is the original tax card, charging each player 500 life points to normal summon, special summon, set, or activate cards from their hand. Very annoying, but this also doesn't even get played in a duel. Instead, it's used by Bakura to deal with some of Pegasus's guards, so once again, not sure if it counts. Change of Heart, on the other hand, is iconic. While not going wild after its recent unbanning, it was forbidden for years. And as an unconditional way to take a monster for a turn, you might understand why. You get all the benefits of the monster, and if you don't want to give it back, you can simply use it as tribute fodder for a bigger monster. So for a while, you'd have to make do with nerfed versions like Brain Control and Mind Control, but just because they were worse doesn't mean they were bad, as both saw tons of play. Even if nowadays that kind of effect by itself isn't going to carry enough weight to take you through a tournament. Careful though, it does have a hidden effect where it'll take control of your own monster, but thankfully, it only seems to come up if you have the Millennium Ring, so you should be safe. Lastly is Just Desserts, a normal trap card that burns your opponent for 500 damage for each monster they control. Meant to punish Yami Yugi for getting his friend's soul cards out of his hand to keep them from being discarded. And while you won't see it in many modern burn lists today, it was a pretty popular schoolyard pick. It's actually kind of wild seeing how many powerful older cards originated from this duel alone. You could say it's a real treat. Alright, let's move things forward a bit and talk about Bakura's Battle City cards. For the monsters, at least the ones that are printed in the TCG, the normal ones are Earthbound Spirit, the Earl of Demise, Headless Knight, the Portrait Secret, the Gross Ghost of Fled Dreams, a top 10 name right there, and Souls of the Forgotten. The anime has two more, but are actually effect monsters for us. Gurnia, a level 4 dark zombie monster with 1300 attack and 1200 defense, which once per turn during your next standby phase after this face-up card you control was destroyed by an opponent's card effect and sent to the grave, special summon it from your grave. An effect that would see improvements in other cards moving forward, but didn't see much success on this one. What did persevere was the next card, Goblin Zombie! It's a level 4 dark zombie monster with 1100 attack and 1050 defense, and yeah, it was a normal monster, but ended up being way more useful for us. If it deals battle damage to an opponent they mill 1, on a theme for Bakura, and when sent from the field to the graveyard, add a zombie monster with 1200 or less defense from your deck to your hand. And yes, while it says when, it is mandatory, so if you link or synchro with this, you get a replacement. It can even get you another copy of Goblin Zombie if you're feeling fresh. This was a powerhouse back in the day, and still sees abundant play in historic formats. Just goes to show that goblins really are the best. Next up, we have the proper effect monsters, starting with Dark Ruler Hades, a level 6 Dark Fiend monster with 2450 attack and 1600 defense. It can't be special summoned from the grave, and you negate the effects of monsters destroyed by battle with fiend monsters that you control. This card has seen its fair share of appearances, and for good reason. 
At only one tribute, it provides a very valuable effect for the time period, stopping monsters with floating effects. Shining Angel and Mystic Tomato were all the rage, so having a way to halt that, not just with itself, but any fiend monster you play alongside it, was a pretty useful option to have in your toolbox, and would live on long past its prime, being reimagined as a zombie monster, showing up in various card arts, even being a namesake for one of the most effective ways to break a monster combo board. Dark Ruler, no more which ironically meant that he wouldn't stop being around for quite some time. It even has a special animation in Master Duel for crying out loud. Next up, we have Jaugen the Spiritualist, a level 3 light spellcaster monster with 200 attack and 1300 defense, lets you discard a random card to destroy all special summoned monsters on the field, and while on the field, neither player can special summon monsters. Yeah, we've got another banger! What was Yami Bakura cooking? Whenever an anti-meta or stun deck needs a floodgate, they have a variety of choices, but Jaugen is special, as it's one of the few monsters that lock out special summons that can itself be special summoned. So while that means that if you do so, its activated effect is going to be a little less helpful, as long as you have a way to draw away attacks from it and your opponent hasn't already established a board, they're going to find it pretty tough getting back on their feet. Hey, uh, fun fact, did you remember that Spellbook of Judgment is now at 1? Just saying. The last monster we'll be talking about in this section is Puppet Master, a level 6 dark fiend monster with 0 attack and defense, and when tribute summoned, you can pay 2000 life points, then target 2 fiend monsters in your grave and special summon them, but they cannot attack this turn. This card wasn't super busted, but it could still get a little cheesy. While the monsters aren't able to attack that turn, you did still get any two fiends without any restrictions. The only barrier to entry was getting the tribute fodder for this, as well as the heaping helping of life points you'd lose summoning this, both from the cost and from getting hit by a monster. Just goes to show that no matter how good an effect is, there's always going to be some strings attached. Next up, we have those Battle City Spells and Traps. Dark Designator is a normal spell card that has you declaring a monster card name, and if the declared card is in your opponent's deck, they add one of that card to their hand. So, um, hey, why would anyone ever play this? Well, I'm sure some of you can come up with some absolutely silly ideas, but Bakura uses it specifically to force Yami Merrick to put the Winged Dragon of Ra into their hand before following up with the card Exchange to steal it, a card that won't be covered here because it's not exclusively a Bakura card. It's a pretty sly move, but the final duel of the season was always going to be Yugi vs Merrick, and no amount of trickery is going to get past that amount of plot armor. The Dark Door is a continuous spell card that limits both players to only attacking with a single monster each turn. This is, by some accounts, a Floodgate, and like most, the trick is using the symmetry to your advantage. For instance, Bakura's Destiny board strategy doesn't need to attack at all to win, so it doesn't hurt him at all, while slowing down the ability for your opponent to close out the game with the primary method of throwing a bunch of monsters at their face. It's kind of like Mystic Mine in that way, just, you know, one door of it. Dark Spirit of the Silent is a normal trap card that you can activate when your opponent's monster declares an attack. The attack is negated, then you select another face-up monster your opponent controls, and that monster attacks instead. If it's in face-up defense position, that monster is changed to attack position. This is a pretty funny way to get your opponent to swing in with something unfavorable. Also, remember this ectoplasmic entity, cause we're gonna be seeing them again, and no, I will not be silent about it. Multiple Destruction is a normal trap card that you can activate if both players have three or more cards in their hand. Each player places their entire hand on the bottom of their deck in any order, also you lose life points equal to the total number of cards returned to the deck by this effect times 300, minimum 1, then each player draws 5 cards. Dang, they had to nerf this card hard before they actually printed it, huh? The anime version actually discards the cards, so it's basically card destruction, and you only take 100 damage for each card. I guess replacing the discard with placing on the bottom of the deck is arguably a nerf, depending on the matchup, but that's not really relevant. The only time this is going to be helpful is when you're going first, where you can play out your hand and your opponent draws into their six. This way, it's kind of like you're ripping one card out of their hand, but the downside is that you need to make sure you keep at least three of your own cards in hand to even use this, so you're not able to pop off as hard as you would like. And when you're taking a minimum of 1800 damage, it's just not worth it. However, knowing the Japanese name of this card is worth it. Dying altogether is just such a whimsical way to describe the demise of a whole group of people, I just can't get over it. Alright, now it's time for the cleanup section 
We're covering cards from the less dual monster focused Millennium World arc, as well as some manga cards. Doom Caliber Knight is a level 4 Dark Fiend monster with 1900 attack and 1800 defense that can't be special summoned. If a monster effect is activated as a quick effect, you tribute this face-up card to negate the activation, and if you do, destroy that monster. This was a competitive powerhouse for a while in the same vein as Thunder King Ryo, an absolutely massive normal summon paired with some kind of stun effect. There was one issue though, Doom Calibur's negate is mandatory, so if your opponent had a monster effect that they're okay with throwing into Doom Cal, then there really wasn't a way to hold off on its effect to play around a later card, you just had to say goodnight tonight. It's also incredible insofar as, like Goblin Zombie, this was a normal monster in the anime. Yeah, this effect was completely fabricated for paper play and I've gotta say, very proud of Legendary Ebb and Steed for branching out from Six Samurais because they are doing very well for themselves here. And I could say something similar about our next card, Necroface. Yeah, Necroface. It's kind of mind-blowing just how many famous cards Bakura is responsible for. It's a level 4 dark zombie monster with 1200 attack and 1800 defense, and if this card is normal summoned, shuffle all banished cards into the deck. And this card gains 100 attack for each card shuffled into the main deck by this effect. And if this card is banished, each player banishes 5 cards from the top of their deck, or their entire deck if there are less than 5. So yeah, this card has never been used for anything wholesome in its entire unlife. Sometimes you'll see people running it as a way to counteract the cost of the most recent pot of cards, but it's far more devastating as a way to mill, especially in decks that love having their own cards banished. And the worst thing is that it isn't once per turn, so you could end up cascading from one Necroface mill into another, and lord help you if the deck is planning on recycling the Necrofaces to use those effects again. This is another sinful little card that was, as far as I can tell, also a normal monster in the manga. We can't keep letting the designers get away with this! Diabound Colonel is a level 5 Dark Fiend monster with 1800 attack and 1200 defense, and when this card declares an attack, it gains 600 attack. As a quick effect, you can target a face-up monster your opponent controls, and it loses attack equal to this card's current attack until the end of the turn, then banish this card until the standby phase of the next turn. This makes for a pretty slippery monster that, even when it leaves the field, ends up protecting your life points by reducing your opponent's battle capability. Unless they, you know, send the targeted monster away as material, but that's neither here nor there. Now, I'm gonna be real here, since this is the dual monsters versions of the Thief King Bakura's stand, I'm surprised we haven't gotten legacy support to expand on this, somehow incorporating Diabound's ability to absorb the power of creatures it destroys into its design. Though considering how Diabound was actually made, uh, you know, as a conglomerate of souls from an entire sacrificed village, maybe we don't need to pop this particular kernel. Spiritualism kind of counts? It's a normal spell card that returns a spell or trap card your opponent controls to the hand, and this card's activation and effect cannot be negated. So no matter what, your opponent is getting a card bounced back, if they still have one on resolution that is, this isn't Nightbeam after all, but this technically isn't a Bakura card. It looks like the card Poltergeist from the manga, or at least the effect it had, but it does have the dark spirit of the silent in there, so you know, we can give it a pass, I guess. Call of the Earthbound is a normal trap card that you can activate when an opponent's monster declares an attack, and it lets you choose the attack target. This is kind of like Dark Spirit of the Silent, but actually works on the attacking monster, not one of its partners, and has the distinction of letting Bakura say he runs an Earthbound deck. And if he ever needs a field spell for him, Dark Sanctuary is one heck of an option. Our last card is Zoma the Spirit, a continuous trap card that, when activated, is special summoned in defense position as a level 4 dark zombie effect monster with 1800 attack and 500 defense, that is also still treated as a trap card. If this card, summoned this way, is destroyed by battle, inflict damage to your opponent equal to the attack of the monster that destroyed it. This means you've got a pretty effective wall against your opponent, especially if their life points are low enough. You can even force this if your opponent doesn't want to run head fast into damage, because you can turn it upright during your turn and just crash it. That may not seem pretty good in regular Yu-Gi-Oh, which, you know, valid, but it's so good in Speed Duel that it's currently at limit 1, a distinction that anyone that plays Duel Links will be familiar with. Basically, if you run this, not only can you only run a single copy of it, you're also giving up the ability to play any other card in the Limit 1 designation. And for those not familiar with Speed Duel's current ban list, playing Zoma means you're giving up the opportunity to run Reinforcement of the Army or Jinzo. 
And let me tell you, if there's a more glowing endorsement of speed duels where cards like Zoma the Spirit can end up being meta, then I haven't seen it. Okay, that's it. We've covered every one of Bakura's cards up there in the TCG, except for the ones I feel are the core Bakura cards, the ones that the legacy support from Immortal Destiny was built around. And I can't think of a better place to start with than the apocalyptic alphabet soup itself, Destiny Board. It's a continuous trap card, and once per turn, during your opponent's end phase, place a spirit message card from your hand or deck in your spell and trap zone face up, in the proper order of I, N, A, and L. When any spirit message card or destiny board leaves the field, send all spirit message cards and destiny board you control to the grave. But when this card and all four spirit message cards with different names are placed on your field, you win the duel! That's right, it's the Exodia that surges itself, though very slowly, and is vulnerable to basically everything. And, you know, hot take here, but no matter what kind of support this gets, there's no way this is going to be good in any competitive sense. But, as a low-stakes deck that challenges your opponent to close the game out in a certain period of time, or otherwise find a way to undo the win condition, I can see it being pretty fun. Not to mention all the things you could do with skills and rule changes to make it more intense if you're so inclined. The only issue here is... You can't trust players with cards that have letters on them. It's like Pokemon with Unknown. You give the players a way to spell something and you're gonna regret it. Okay, now that we've covered the iconic card, let's get back to our regularly scheduled monster spell trap card order. Starting with Dark Spirit of Banishment, a level 3 Dark Fiend monster with 600 attack and 0 defense. If your opponent's monster attacks at the start of the damage step, you can send this card from your hand or field to the grave, then target a level 8 Fiend monster in your grave and special summon it. But its effects are negated, and if you do, change the attack target to it and perform damage calculation. And if any number of level 8 Fiend monsters are sent to your grave while this card is in your grave, except during the damage step, you can add this card to your hand. This makes for a pretty nifty hand trap that just throws gigantic fiends in the way of attacks, which is a great homage to the original Dark Spirit of the Silent. Sure, the effects are negated, but effects aren't battle. Battle is battle. We've also got a very close cousin, Dark Spirit of Malice. It has the exact same stats and works in a similar way. When your opponent activates any card or effect as a quick effect, you can send this card from your hand or field to the graveyard, then target a level 8 fiend monster in your grave and special summon it, but its effects are negated. And if any number of level 8 fiend monsters are sent to your grave except during the damage step, you can add this card from your grave to your hand, thus resetting the cycle of summoning big monsters, losing them, getting the spirits back, then doing it all over again. And the only time they don't check for that return effect is during the damage step, so you're encouraged to use those fiends as material for other summons so you can keep reaping all the benefits. Also, big props to the artist here. While these two are largely based on the Dark Spirit of the Silent, they also collectively reference the Gross Ghost of Fled Dreams, once again, can't reiterate it enough, great name, Headless Knight, The Portrait Secret, and Earthbound Spirit. Way to go! Though, pro tip, welding those monsters to your soul gestalt isn't going to make you any more... normal. Dark Necrophia is a level 8 Dark Fiend monster with 2200 attack and 2800 defense that can't be normal summoned or set, and must first be special summoned from your hand by banishing 3 fiend monsters from your grave. During the end phase, if this card is in the grave because it was destroyed in your monster zone by your opponent's card and sent there this turn, you can target a face-up monster your opponent controls and equip this card to that target. And while this card is equipped to a monster by this effect, take control of that monster. That's not a bad deal! You get a 2800 defense wall that, when destroyed, turns your opponent's monsters against them. And the must first part of that summon clause is very important. Once Dark Necrofear has been properly summoned, you can revive it using the Dark Spirit monsters. In fact, this works very well with Banishment specifically, as that will force the battle, and if it's big enough to get over the defense stat, or the attack one if you don't mind the life point loss, then you're getting a little present later on in the turn. And sure, you're not going to get the Dark Spirit back from the battle destruction because of damage step shenanigans, but once the equipped version of Dark Necrofear goes to the grave, that'll get fixed up right quick. What a doll. Curse Necrofear is a level 8 Dark Fiend monster with 2800 attack and 2200 defense that also can't be normal summoned or set, and must be special summoned by a card effect. You can target 3 banished fiend monsters to special summon this card from your hand, and if you do, shuffle those targeted banished monsters into the deck. 
During the end phase, if this card is in the grave because it was destroyed in your monster zone by an opponent's card and sent there this turn, special summon this card from your grave, then you can destroy cards your opponent controls up to the number of face-up spell and trap cards you control with different names. This is the much more aggressive version of Dark Necrofear and makes for a very strong complement to it. By summoning Dark, you've set up the conditions to summon Curse, and its own self-revival effect will have it keep coming back turn after turn to haunt your opponent. This effect also pairs very well with Destiny Board, as the further along you are in it, the more removal Curse can leverage. It even counts your field spell. Though, to be fair, it doesn't just work with Destiny Board. It counts any face-up spell and trap cards you control with different names, so it works well with any advantage generators or floodgates. Truly, we are cursed to play stun forever and ever. Okay, quick detour, we've got to talk about this card here. It's never shown up as a proper card in the show, but considering the source material, I think you'll understand. Dark Master Zork is a level 8 Dark Fiend Ritual Monster with 2700 attack and 1500 defense that you can ritual summon using Contract with the Dark Master, which is your pretty bog standard ritual spell. Once per turn, you can roll a 6-sided dice, then destroy all monsters your opponent controls if you roll a 1 or a 2, destroy one monster your opponent controls if you roll a 3, 4, or 5, or destroy all monsters you control on a 6. So you've got a roughly 17% chance of completely whiffing and munching all of your own monsters but every other time, you get to pick apart their board. Heck, a full third of the time, this is just Raigeki. What's really wild, though, is that this is fully compatible with our Dark Spirits. Once Zork is summoned properly, it's fair game to summon again. So if you do botch it and blow up all your monsters, including Zork, that will let the spirits come back to your hand, at which point you can activate them to bring Zork back. Curse Necrofear also makes for great ritual fodder because then it's in the grave for the spirits to revive, shortcutting its own summoning method. Is it optimal? Not at all. Is it fun? Hell yeah! This is Bakura we're talking about, so it's not a real shadow game unless you roll them bones. Dark Spirit's Mastery is a normal spell card that has you discarding a card to add a Destiny board or any level 8 fiend monster from your deck or grave to your hand. You can also banish this card from your grave, except the turn it was sent to the grave, to place any number of Destiny board and or Spirit Message cards with different names from your hand or grave on the bottom of your deck in any order then draw the same number of cards. This gives you a second shot at your Destiny board play if the first round goes awry, and it even gets you some sweet draws for your troubles. Not to mention that it helps get you the card that starts the whole thing, as well as getting you your Necrofears, so it does a great job of helping you get to your game plan as quickly as possible. Now if only it looked better than a poor attempt at an analog horror jump scare, then I'd be fully on board. Dark Sanctuary is a field spell card, and if a spirit message card would be placed on your field with Destiny board, you can special summon it as a level 1 Dark Fiend normal monster with zero attack and defense instead. And if you do, it's unaffected by any card effects except for Destiny board. That monster also can't be targeted for attacks, but does not prevent your opponent from attacking directly. When an opponent's monster declares an attack, toss a coin, and if the result is heads, negate the attack. And if you do, inflict damage to your opponent equal to half the current attack of that opponent's monster. Now that's a pretty great way to complicate the win con, huh? Either your opponent sits there, does nothing, and watches you win, or risks their life points on attacks, possibly destroying themselves in the process. And by summoning the spirit messages as monsters, that means your spell and trap zones are now open to use for other cards, which is one of Destiny Board's biggest weaknesses. Finding this card to pair with Destiny Board is going to be essential to any deck running this strategy, but oh, why does it have so many eyes? See, now that's how you do the scary thing, the big unnatural moving eyes. That's what gets you. Sentence of Doom is a continuous trap card that targets any number of your fiend monsters that are banished or are in your grave, up to the number of destiny board and or spirit message cards you control, and add them to your hand. And you can send this card from your spell and trap zone to the grave to place a spirit message card from your hand, deck, or grave into your spell and trap zone, which is treated as being placed there by the effect of destiny board and you can only use one effect of this card per turn, and only once per turn. This is a card that's much easier to justify play with Dark Sanctuary in rotation, freeing up your back row, but even if it isn't, you can always send it away to replace it with another spirit message. And the longer that message gets, the more free fiends you get back in rotation. It's just an all-around solid card that speeds up your win con by a turn. It's so good, in fact, that I think it's got me in the mood to sing the Doom Song now. Alright, so that's all the Bakura cards, but what do we do with them? 
Well, just focusing on the cards from the last section, our goal should be a kind of value-oriented deck, focusing on using Dark and Cursed Necrofear as much as possible to provide the beatdown, and while I don't think it's going to be our main plan of action, we should still run the Destiny board package to accentuate the power of our other cards. Either our opponent doesn't bother with them and you get more value out of Cursed Necrofear and Sentence of Doom, or they get rid of them and you get to refill your grip with Dark Spirit's Mastery. For them, it's a lose-lose. But we're gonna need a host of good level 8 fiends to help us seal our opponent's destiny, so what can we play to help them out? First up, how about them fiends? Abominable Unchained Soul isn't looking too bad. It's got its own summon method, so it's not reliant on our own cards, and has removal, so what's not to love? Archfiend Emperor, the first Lord of Horror, is a great pick to summon off of either of our Dark Spirits. Not only is it a 3000 attack behemoth, by negating its effects, you are also no longer under its Fiend-only special summon lock, keeping your extra deck wide open, though it does lack its own form of removal in that case. Diabolica the Draconic General feels like it was almost tailor-made for this job, having a special summon method that lines up with how we play while recurring our fiends. Invader of Darkness basically shuts off Runic, which is more than enough reason to run it, but also stops other common back row removal cards like MST, Twin Twisters, and Cosmic Cyclone. Lava Golem is a searchable kaiju that also has the benefit of adding in some frustrating burn, which is very on brand for Bakura. And speaking of things Bakura would do, the Suppression Pluto is a must play to keep in the spirit of things. I mean, sure, it's a GX manga card, not a DM one, but if you use Dark Designator, then this works like a charm. Lovely and Lady Labyrinth also fall into this category, but they've got enough of their own stuff going on that they don't really need the help. Dark Sanctuary can make room for all the trap cards, but then it's competing for space with Labyrinth Labyrinth, so you know how it is. But with all these level 8 monsters, what kind of rank 8 monsters can we make? Dingirsu gets your removal, Lancelot gets you some negation, and with all of our dark monsters, Zombie Stein is a great way to push for game while also providing some level of interaction. The new number Chaos 62, Neo Galaxy Eyes Prime Photon Dragon is pretty easy to make. Just make original Prime Photon Dragon and lay this on top. It ends up representing a total of 12,000 damage across three monster attacks, which can be really brutal. You're not going to get the extra attack and monster effect negation, but depending on the board state, it might not matter. Speaking of OTK tools though, Draglubian can represent lethal alongside Numeron Dragon, especially if you can get another rank 8 on board to get into the quintuple digit attack. And of course, any discussion about the rank 8 suite isn't complete without number 38, Hope Harbinger, Bobonger, Ding Dang Dragonger, Ting Tang Titanic, Galaxy! Walla walla ping ping. Because our Dark Spirits are level 3 fiends, that makes them perfect targets for Tour Guide of the Underworld. From here, you can either make a rank 3 of your choosing, or a link 2. Cherubini can send the other Dark Spirit to the grave so you can have both in rotation, or you can get Muckraker from the Underworld. It gives a replacement effect for your monsters to protect against destruction, and can even trade a card in hand to revive any fiend in your grave, which means you get another quick way to summon Curse Necrofear. But if you're really dedicated to winning via Destiny board, you can summon Beat Cop from the Underworld instead. From there, you can tribute a monster to put a patrol counter on Destiny board to keep it safe from one piece of destruction, giving you a little extra piece of insurance. But what if you already have both Dark Spirits in rotation? Well, I've got a great alternate target for you, and that's Doom Dog Octhros. When sent from the field to the grave, you can add any level 8 fiend from your deck to your hand. So it's like a whole other Dark Spirits mastery search. And if you're worried you'll draw it without being able to summon it out with Tour Guide, fret not, as you can normal summon it, and it has less than a thousand attack. So Salomon Great All Mirage can just send this to the grave so you can still get your search. When it comes to protecting Destiny board, you might want to consider running a few copies of Imperial Customs. This is only really feasible if you have Dark Sanctuary on board to free up some room, but it could keep some destruction off your back long enough to keep Destiny board in rotation. Plus, it also counts as a differently named trap card to go towards Cursed Necrofear, so it does provide some utility. As for a silly tech pick, Emergency Teleport, using it to summon Mental Tuner. Why? Well, as is, we can tune it with our level 8s to help us make Psychic and Punisher. If you're behind on life points, this is a great way to close the gap, and honestly, if you're on Destiny board, that's not out of the question. Or, you could use its level modulating effect, preferably recycling a dark monster, but you could banish one if need be, 
reducing its level down to 2. Now it combines with your level 8s to make all kinds of level 10 synchros, but the reason we need a light monster specifically is to get maximum value out of Chaos Angel. From that point, you get the Banish from the Summon, it's unaffected by monster effects, and it can't be destroyed by battle, all on a 3500 attack monster, which is a pretty scary thing to add to a potential win con. Oh, and keep in mind that the Banish removal procs on Special Summon, not Synchro Summon, so if you have Muckraker, that's just free removal. Alright, that's all the cards, but how does it stack up against the Nova Scale? Novelty. While this isn't the game's first alternate win condition, it certainly gains a lot of points for how unique it goes about it. Seeing the spirit messages pile up turn after turn really does induce a feeling of dread that's hard to replicate otherwise. And the new cards complement this, giving the deck a more traditional way to play so it doesn't automatically fold to any competent removal while not erasing what makes it special. So, the Destiny board cards get a 5 in novelty from me. Objectivity. While the phrase Auto win might seem like it should basically disqualify this theme from this category, the issue is that it actually takes a lot of effort to actually win via Destiny board. I'd wager that even with the best tools you can get a hold of, you'd find it challenging to take on your local locals. But thankfully, this means you won't have to worry about your run at a high profile event being ended surreptitiously because some punk spelled really hard at you. So Destiny board also gets a 5 in objectivity. Versatility. The uniqueness of this deck doesn't lend itself very well to crossovers with other themes. Newer cards incorporate a good level 8 fiend toolbox, and with minimal restrictions it means the rank 8 pool is open as well, but both are fairly shallow. So while there are a multitude of cards that you can work with, it's not enough to get more than a 2 in versatility. Awesomeness. Honestly, I love alt win conditions. Seeing how decks are constructed and played to take advantage of this new feature is really fascinating. And while it can sometimes lead to people playing some very unfun text, looking at you again, Mystic Mine, I'm so glad you're gone, Destiny Board is full of flavor and minimal with cheese. Now, I'm personally not jonesing to play it myself, but I do like it conceptually, so this is going to get a 4 on awesomeness from me, bringing Destiny Board to a respectable 16 on the Nova scale. And that's all I have to say about Bakura and his cards, especially those cool Destiny board ones. I'm gonna be honest, this was kind of a wild ride. When I came to terms with the fact that I'd have to talk about a lot of unrelated cards, I was kind of worried. But seeing how many fondly remembered and straight up powerful cards came from this character alone was a blast through and through. And honestly, the Destiny board cards are kind of cool. Maybe one day we'll get those new Diabound cards and the true Bakura deck will shine. But for now, I think that's a wrap on another wonderful episode of Zorkin Pals. But now, I want to hear what you all have to say. Is Destiny Board an occult masterpiece worthy of reverence, or nothing more than a cheap party trick? And which Bakura card is your favorite? Me? I'm a hot desk kind of guy. I love how many situations that goofball shows up in. The range they have! What an actor. Let me know in the comments, and if you haven't already, please make sure to like the video, subscribe so you don't miss an episode, and share this video with somebody you know who loves Yu-Gi-Oh! It really does a lot to help me out. Today's episode was brought to you in part by Dragon Shield. When you want to protect your cards with the power of Dragon Scales, get some sweet lore for them, and support the channel, check out my link in the description to get started. Today's episode is also brought to you by my lovely patrons, including this month's illustrious Quasar Commander, Frankie, Nebula Navigator's Third Dynasty, Ada Basilisk, Adam Zajdel, Andrew Newman, Kane Senpai, Chibi Gohan, Christopher Fuss, Clockswork, Danny Bound, Dark Dragon X830, Eric, Aaron the World Breaker, Garland Chaos, Genesis Yu-Gi-Oh, Green Knight, Great Big Pillock, Hair Bear, Harry the Ominous Benefactor, Howling Zangetsu, Hydrocraft 135, Iron Zero, Iskander 711, Mana Charge, Marion James E. Picotta, Mega Combi, Millennia Asta, Molly Renata, Nathan Vig, Natiel Lee Alexander, Orozco 09096, Panther J, Rebel King Lucifer, RJ the Jank Monarch, Sammy Haim, Sir Knight JCB, Sky Buster Leo, The Wizard Moose, URTV 667 and Xander Wolfensberger, Cosmic Crusaders Almento 5010, A Random Pup, Ariel Kersey, Beluga Masta, Blue Gem, Chaz Ghost, Corbinisms, Drakenwald, Drake and SpongeBob be like you used to call me on your cell phone, Dripfed Tar, Eki Bullock, Emony, Eva Padilla, Hike Boyajian, Herbal D, Inblink, Jester Designs, Kale the Dragon, Carp, 
Kendall Wishmeyer, Kevon Public, King Scarlet Yu-Gi-Oh, Lemon Yu-Gi-Oh, Lord whoop de doo Manga Pages, Matt Simmons, Michael Shimabukuro, Nitromo, Shizuki Nijimura, Sophie, apparently, Stephen Williamson, Taylor Seymour, The Legendary Raven, Tucker Ordorn, Venusian Teapot, and Zaldreka, as well as the lovely Starlight Explorers you see on screen now. If you'd like to help me in my quest to cover all of Yu-Gi-Oh's archetypes, watch my videos early, participate in monthly custom card reviews, and be a part of these credits, I'd very much appreciate it if you checked out my link in the description and consider joining, as every pledge helps make the channel that much better and helps make all this a little more stable. And if you'd like to see another video about big fiends doing heinous things, check out this video I made covering Fabled. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye